Come on, y'all ready? Oh, we're going to get after it tonight. Before we get started, can we welcome the Clean Campus as they're joining us on their very first Wednesday series? It's a big one to be joining us in on. It's going to be good. It's going to be awesome. I'm believing that God is going to be moving in their lives. Remember, in the very beginning of the book of Revelation, God promises us, Jesus himself promises us that we will all receive a special blessing. For those who read the words of this book, for those who hear the words of this book, and for those who do the words of this book, we are all promised an amazing blessing from God, and I'm believing and standing in faith for you to receive yours, I hope. You're believing for me to receive mine, yeah? All right, let's get rolling because this is going to be a cruncher. I'm only going to do two churches today, but they're big ones. They're huge ones as we're going to build through. So we're going to jump right into it. We're picking up in verse 18. We're picking up right up in verse 18 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 18, the seven churches... We've been talking about this, that these churches are not just literal, but they're physical churches, but they're also a spiritual atmosphere of a church. It's the climate of a church. And there will also now, listen, be only seven types of genuine Christian churches in the world. All, all churches will fall underneath one of these seven categories. So number four is today is Thyatira. Thyatira is located in Turkey between Pergamon and and Sardis. Thyatira was a, a city that was known for its trade and its iron working. Thyatira was a very key city back in these days, and we pick it up with the words of Jesus in verse 18. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. So what does Jesus look like in heaven? We start to get a glimpse of it right here, that he has eyes that are like flames of fire, and his feet are like polished bronze. But what does the rest of him look like? Do you know that the Bible explicitly in multiple places describes exactly what Jesus looks like? You want to hear it? All right, you got to come back because we're going to do it tonight. Sorry to set you up like that. All right, verse 19. We're going to hit it because in Revelation it's talked about. All right, verse 19, here comes the compliment. Remember, there's a compliment to most of the churches. There is, there is a correction to almost all the churches, and then there is a commendation, a if you do this, I'm going to reward you with that to all the churches, okay? So here is the compliment to Thyatira. I know all the deeds that you do. I've seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all of these things. That sounds like a pretty awesome church, doesn't it? They're, they're loving, they're faithful, they're serving, they're patient, patiently enduring. That, that sounds like a pretty awesome church. So what could be wrong? And Jesus goes in to the next, which is his complaint. But I have this, this one complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. So this is Jesus' big complaint. This church is killing it in four major categories. But they are missing it in one humongously major category because they are literally, they're acting like Ahab. So this Jezebel, some theologians believe this is just a single woman that was causing problems in that church. Some people believe it is the spirit or the essence, just like the churches are in atmosphere, but it was the atmosphere of the woman that we know of in the Old Testament that is referred to as Jezebel. She was the wife of Ahab. She was the, king. She was the queen of all the land, and she hated God. 
She hated God's people. She had all of her own false prophets. She led God's people astray. The parallel here here is too remarkably exact to say that this is just one specific woman, in my opinion. I believe, remember what he says, he says, that Jezebel. So that means there's more than one Jezebel. Are you hearing me? And some folks are like, what the heck is a Jezebel? A Jezebel doesn't have to be a woman. It could be a man. A Jezebel is somebody who is controlling, divisive, manipulating. And it's all to take away from the glory of God and bring attention to their self, their gifts. Hey, look at me. Look what I'm doing. And they lead people astray, whether it be through sexual sin, false doctrine, whether it be through fruitcake Christianity. But Jezebels are absolutely still present in the churches today. We try to, we try to, we, we, you, you know, in the military, we had, this is probably a bad analogy, but we, 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 had, we had this technology right when I was coming into the Marine Corps that we would call it painting the target, where we would laser a target so that an airplane or a ship off the coast would be able to hone a missile in and hit something through a window because we painted the target. We have a strong practice here at Reach Church at painting every Jezebelic person that we have ever encountered so that we can hone in the Holy Spirit to do what he does best and either set them free or drive them out. Because here's the truth. Most of them are very hard to turn because they're so self-indulged. Watch what Jesus says. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering. That's not the kind of bed any of us want to lie down in, right? We like, you know, memory foam or pillow top, stuff stuff that's soft to land on, cozy, comfort, right? Right? I'm going to throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her. What does that mean? That's not just adultery in the flesh. This is speaking of adultery in the spirit. When we cheat on Jesus by allowing false doctrine into our lives, we are committing adultery on our Savior. Remember, we are the bride of Christ. For those who commit adultery with her, they will suffer greatly unless... And I love Jesus. He's full of grace. They repent and turn from, listen, not their evil deeds, from her evil deeds. Sometimes you don't know that you just got yourself wrapped up in a Jezebelic spirit. Sometimes you're not aware or understanding that you've, you've allowed somebody to manipulate. We've had this happen at Reach. Every church has had. I've never heard of a church yet that hasn't had this happen. Because people are imperfect, and Jezebels know it, and they're coming in, and people are hurting, and they're looking for more, and they're looking for answers, and and the Jezebelic spirit understands that, comes in, and always first is flattering. Always wants to give a thousand compliments to everybody. Wants to win you over with flattery and, and, and compliments, and then... As that spirit flatters you and, and makes, then, the, then it'll make you feel more important than you need to feel. And what I mean by that is, like, all of a sudden, you, you have to feel, if this church doesn't do it this way because this is the way you like it, the church is wrong. So the, the whole family of 2,000 people are wrong because of two. And that's the way the spirit works. And then it starts to gather allies and and build groups and and try to, the ultimate thing is this, they don't want to be the pastor, they want to control the pastor. I'm going to tell you something, and I say this before the Holy Spirit with great fear in my heart, the one thing that I will never allow happen is some spirit that is not of the Holy Spirit to control me. I hate control. I don't like anything that controls me. And this is something I've experienced when I was a youth pastor. I've experienced it. So all that said, I'm giving you from a church perspective, but this could impact your life in a very specific way individually. So you have to be sober and you have to be vigilant to not allow. When people come up to you, hear this now. 
And they say, hey, what did you think about the men's conference? What did you think about Wednesday night service? What did you think about what pastor said? You know what they're really saying? Hey, you tell me what you think because then it gives me the right for me to tell you what I think. I'm going to build off of what you said to tell you what I said, and I'm going to turn it all around and be able to complain, gossip, cause division and discord. If you don't like something, tell the person that caused you not to like it. Or leave. That's, that's the options that God gives us. This is America. We're, we're, we're a free nation. We could vote with our feet, right? If I didn't like this church, I wouldn't be here. I love this church. It's an awesome church, but we've got we've to protect this church. As a family, it's up to, to me and the pastoral staff and the elders ultimately as shepherding you to watch out for the wolves, but, but we can't see every single one of them. You've got to give up ah, every now and then, right, when the wolf comes around. All right. Let's move on. He says, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the minds. He's searching the thoughts and the hearts. He's searching our intentions of every person. Who does Jesus search out the minds and the hearts of? Every person. So we could feel like we can get away with something when we whisper in a little dark corner. We could feel like we can get away with something when we talk to a friend. We could feel like we could, but, but Jesus, we could feel like we get away with something when we're just thinking it and contemplating it and letting it brew in our own hearts. But Jesus knows it, and he wants to give us all time to turn from that stuff because that stuff is never good. What good does it do? Do you follow me? Come on now, you all here? This does no good. If somebody doesn't like the temperature the room is, then wear a jacket or take one off. Just stay clothed. Don't get naked. If it's that hot, then you got to let us know, right? But for you to walk around telling everybody how hot it is or how cold, and I'm using a silly analogy, but you get what I'm saying. If, if you're that person that just wants to complain about what it is, then, then my, my thought always is, is, why are you here? I was just talking to a, a businessman, and, and he was telling me that you know he runs his business in such a way that one of his employees, one of his guys that's one of his managers, walks up to him and starts complaining about the lack of work that people are doing. And the, and the boss says, hey, it ain't getting no better with you standing here. Go out and do your job. The more you're here complaining about it, the more it's allowed to happen out there. Are you here? So I, this, is, this goes beyond just church life. This goes in Christian life. This goes in your workplace, in your family. Don't complain about your spouse to somebody else. Don't do it. It's divisive. And never let another person talk about your spouse to you. I can tell you straight right now, there's not a single human being on this earth that can talk about my pastor, my wife, my family, my church family. Nobody can do it. I don't allow it. I tell them, oh, wait a minute. You got something to say. Why don't you go say it to them? But you say it around me, and if it's offensive, I'll tell them, you say it around me one more time, I'm going to knock you, knock you out. But don't, don't come and talk about my family. Like, you bet my wife one time, we had a couple over, and, and they, they knew our pastor, and they wanted to, they, you know, they knew of him, they didn't really know him, and they just wanted to throw up floaty ideas that they'd heard around, you know, this, that, or the other about the way he runs this and the way he doesn't do this and what he should do. And Melissa said, oh. That's my pastor. And you either stop talking about my pastor right now or leave my home. I was like, dang. Like, I was going to try to handle that a little bit more, with a little bit more diplomacy, but Melissa don't play. She just, pow. But in the end, folks, hear me and hear me super clear tonight. Be loyal. Be faithful to God, to family to church, to your work. Be faithful, be loyal. Those are some of the characteristics that Jesus calls us to live by, but it's also the very characteristics that built this great nation. 
And you want to see why this nation is hurting so bad? We've turned our back on a living God, and we've left the morals that he brings into us as a whole. And we don't have any place for that within the church. Okay? So let's move on. I can see this going on real good. Okay. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. And then this is Jesus' words. That's why I didn't put them in orange. Everything in orange is just my notes. But listen to what he says. Deeper truths, as they call them. Depths of Satan, actually. Let me show you what this means. What does that say? Here's what it was. There's this group of people called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics were, they were teachers of the Gnostic Gospels. It was a perversion of the scriptures that they were spreading heresy throughout that region. The Gnostics were a group from Egypt that added to and took away from the Bible. They called their doctrine the depths of God. Sounds real good. Where Jesus clarifies it's actually the depths of Satan. If somebody said to you, I want to teach you about the depths of God, you would be eager to learn. And if you didn't know any better and they're deceiving you, they could be teaching you the depths of Satan. So how do you know if you're getting duped or not? Because you got to know this. Because everything has to be confirmed with this. That's the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It cannot be changed. And look what Jesus says now. Revelation 22, 18, 19. We'll get to it when we get to it, but I'm going to show it to you right now. And I solemnly declare, Jesus says, to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. Whoo! Temperature just went up. Take your jacket off, but not your shirt. Okay? Look at this now. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. That's deep stuff, right? Won't be messing around with God's, God's word, okay? So here's the commendation. Jesus says, I will ask nothing more of you except this, that you hold fast, hold tight, grab a hold of, grip to your white knuckled if you have to, to what you have what you have learned, what you have gained from me, what, what you are receiving me, hold on to it until I come for you. To all who overcome, who obey me in the very end, to the very end, to them I will give the authority over all nations. That's a pretty awesome promise, isn't it? He's going to give the authority over all nations. We'll talk about what that means just here in a minute, but let me give you three things Christians must do in the face of false doctrine. This is what Jesus just taught us. Out of this revelation we just read, this is what I took. Three things Christians must do in the face of false doctrine. Number one, hold fast. Hold tightly. Grab a hold of what he has taught you, and don't let go. Hebrews 3, 6 backs that up and talks about the promise to those who hold tightly to it. Number two, overcome the temptation of the world. Overcome that false doctrine. Overcome the false teachers. Overcome that by trusting in God and knowing God's word. That's 1 John 5, 4. And number three, obey until the end. Obedience is not a moment Obedience is a lifestyle. And when we obey until the end, John 14, 15 is your reference for that, then Jesus promises heaven, us heaven as if we're already there. So verse 27, he says, They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. What is that talking about? That doesn't mean the church is going to rule the nation now. It's after the seven years of trials and tribulation, when the 1,000 years of total peace on the earth, this 
church that overcomes is going to have part in the authority of reigning over those nations. Verse 28, they will have the same authority. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. You know what that means? It means they are literally going to be filled with the light of God. They are just going to beam with the light of God because it costs so much and it's so hard and such a struggle for them to be able to overcome this. Here's verse 29. Anyone with ears, listen up. Anyone with ears must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying To the churches. So again, remember what we talked about last week. Anytime he says that, it means pay attention to the essence of what I just taught. And here's the essence. Thyatira was the church who had it all together except, like King Ahab, they lacked the courage and they feared to confront Jezebel. We don't want to be that church, right? Number five, Sardis. Sardis was the ancient capital of Lydia, which is now western Turkey. On both sides, it had the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. It was right across the way from Greece. So back then, it was more in the Roman culture. It was a complete pagan city, known for their iron working. And here's what he says to them. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. Notice what comes first to this church. Every other church so far, what's come first is his compliment. I know this good thing about you, but I also see this bad thing. But if you overcome it, I'm going to give you this. It's a yes, no, yes. But here he starts with a a no, which means you in deep doo-doo if you're getting a complaint from Jesus first, right? Hey, it's good to see you, Jesus. Yeah, I got a word with you. You know what I mean? It's like when you done broke the the, the law of your home when you were a child, you came in late after curfew, you didn't do your homework, you did school. Maybe I was the only one that did all three of those things, but one day I think I did all three at once. And you come in the door, and you're like, hey, Ma. And she's like, I've been waiting on you. And I was like, huh? I want you to go in your room, and I want you to think about the whooping I'm about to put on you. I want you to think about why you deserve it. I'm like, oh, God. And then she'd leave you in the room for like an hour to think about it, right? Here's this complaint. I know all the things you do. This is, this is spooky. This is scary. And that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. You have a reputation of being my church. You have a reputation of doing good. You have a reputation of holding me in the center, but you're dead. There's no life in you. That's not a good thing to hear. Wake up, Jesus says. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find your actions. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly, as unexpected as a thief. Why would Jesus come suddenly, unexpected? This church is dead. But the gifts and the call that are on the people of that church are irrevocable. The scripture says that each and every believer, each and every person on the face of this planet has been given at least one gift from God. At least one. 
whether it be prophecy or discernment or, or whether it be miracles or healing or leadership or servanthood or, or mercy or whatever it is, everybody's been given at least one gift from God. And everybody has a call. They have a purpose of why they've been put on this earth. That's why we drive everyone and everything to the next steps process because we want everybody to discover their purpose because you weren't created by accident. You were created on purpose and for a purpose. And Jesus promises us in his word that both the gifts and the call are irrevocable. They can never be removed. But the problem is, is this church is deceived. They think that they are not, but they really are. Remember what we talked about Matthew 6, Matthew 7? There's three kinds of people in the world, those that have the light, let the light shine in their soul. Those are saved ones. Those that have an evil eye that shut out the light, plunge themselves into darkness. Those are those who, uh, who know and hear it, but they absolutely don't want it. Then there's those who think they have the light, but what they really have is darkness and know how deep that darkness is. This is that church. Here's his compliment. Yes, there are some in the church of Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. This church is a super scary church. I'm going to talk about it here in just a minute. Here's the condemnation. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. And then here it goes. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. For those that overcome, those who are victorious, those who overcome this spirit that's in this church, those people that overcome that atmosphere, that attitude, they are going to get announced by Jesus himself to the Father and his angels. That they are his. What is this church? Most believe, and I am one of those most, that this is the church that we see today. You ever been to a dead church? I've been to a couple. There ain't nothing good about it. No fun at all. But this church, remember what it says, they have a great reputation. I believe this church is those super religious churches, those super dogmatic congregations of denominations that look from the outside. They got the steeple. They got Jesus, maybe Jesus on a cross. They got a bunch of bells and whistles. They got everything you need, everything you're supposed to have in the church except Jesus. And that church is super dangerous. This is the less than 2% church. This is the church that contains less than 2% of God. This is the church that is the full-blown religion, where they are counting upon their own actions, their own deeds, their own good works, their own reputation, their own appearance, their own cloud. They're counting on their own selves more than they're counting on anything else. Verse 6 says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. And here's what I believe he's saying. Sardis is a religious church who count more on how they appear to man instead of how they appear to God. This is the church that makes you kiss the ring. This is the church that abandons God's principles and shoves man-made ideas down people's throats and teach it as commands from God. I've been raised in a culture of a church like that. But there are legit ones within it. So you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. That's a really terrible saying. I don't know who ever came up with that. I don't know why you But you get the point, right? You can't judge. Let's just talk. Can we talk super open, super real? Because I come from this background. Catholicism is the most known church in the world. Catholicism has the appearance and reputation of doing all this good work. But we're seeing now as the veil is torn back that there's more evil within that than probably outside of the church at times. 
They have a reputation. Not all of them. I can tell you about a church up in Chicago that is a spirit-filled Catholic church. The priest wears the, the collar and the whole deal, but he'll get up and he'll shout and preach and hoot and lead people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and let the gifts of the Spirit flow. And he is, he is holding true to some other traditions to help people get to God, but he's not abandoned God for man-made ideas. So we can't group everybody together. That's why I don't like to do it. But it is a super dangerous thing. But what I want to focus on, and we're going to wrap up with this today, because I parenthetically inserted last week about the once saved, always saved, and I, I promised God and myself I would stop doing those kind of things because you throw something out there, a one-liner in the middle of a message when you're preaching, and people that don't know the whys and the truth behind what you're saying can get really taken back. Like, oh, I, I've believed that all my life, and he just said in 30 seconds that it's a big lie. And they can actually walk away either scared, mad, or very confused, or maybe a combination of all three. Nobody has complained about it. Nobody has said anything about it. I actually got families that said we were visiting Reach. We started coming on a Wednesday, and when you said that, it made our decision final that this is our home. But I heard from the Holy Spirit when I was preparing for tonight that I don't want to just throw one-liners out there. I need to do better at that and not explain the why. So tonight, I'm going to explain to you why I don't believe in Reach Church does not have a doctrine of once saved, always saved. And it begins first with what Jesus said right here. If you do this, I will never erase your name from the book of life. So we have to understand that he's saying, if you don't, then I will. Are you here? And I'm going to show you some more of this, okay? So once saved, always saved. What's the truth behind it? The doctrine of once saved, always saved is when you say a sinner's prayer, when you say yes to Jesus in a moment, you are saved. I believe that. I'm with them. But where we differentiate is this. They believe you can live any life you want to live. You shouldn't. They don't teach you to do that. They teach you to live a good life. But even if you don't, then either A, you really never got saved because they believe that you couldn't have lived, you couldn't have went out and, and raped somebody or murdered somebody or, or, or stole from somebody after you really got saved. Or they just, some sex of that, not sex, but sex, like S-E-C-T-S. Some sex believe that you just got a free pass because you called on the name of Jesus. You are absolutely guaranteed heaven as if you're already there no matter what you do. And I just want to show you some scripture, and then we're going to go into communion. And I'm going to do this fairly quickly. You can just write down the, the references if you want to look at it later on your own. But look at this, Exodus chapter 32 and verses 32 through 33. This is, this is OT, Old Testament, right? But now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please, this is Moses talking to God, if not, please blot me out of, the, of your book which you have written. So Moses is saying, I love these people, God, and if you won't forgive them, then you gotta, you got to throw me out with them. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. So we see that this dates back the concept that your name was once in the book and can be removed from the book dates back all the way to the very beginning. Now, there was a different set of rules that went along with this because this is before Jesus. It was a lot harder, to be honest with you, to get into heaven this way than it is with Jesus. But watch this now. Look at the psalmist says in Psalm 69, verse 28. 
May they be blotted. He's talking about his enemies and those that have turned their backs on God. May they be blotted out of the book of life. And may they not be recorded with the righteous. So David understood under the unction of the Holy Spirit, under the revelation the Holy Spirit was given him, that it's absolutely possible for people's names to be blotted out of the book of life. Okay? New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. And when the people escape from wickedness, the wickedness of the world, by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then they get, listen to this, no, let's just stop. When people escape the wickedness of the world by knowing, having a relationship, being saved, saying yes to Jesus, right? And then, so it is absolutely possible to get truly saved and have a and then moment. And then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again. They're worse off than before. That's that's not good stuff, right? It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. So it's better for us never to know this life than to know it and walk away from it. Let's just keep moving on. 1 John 2, 24. So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. So if you don't, you won't. Are y'all here? And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17. This kind of talk spreads like cancer. Talking about that kind of Jezebelic talk I was talking about earlier, that, that divisive talk, that, 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 that uh, uh, pharmaceutical, better than thou religious talk, all of that stuff, it's, it spreads like cancer, as in the case of Hymenaeus and Philitus. They have left, watch this now, they have left, they left, they chose to leave. Nobody could take your salvation from you. It's your choice to say yes, and it's your choice to either remain in that yes or to walk away. They have left the path of truth, claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. In this way, they have turned some people away from the faith. So there's some more people being turned away from the faith. First Timothy. Two more and I'll be done. So I advise, or actually one more because we already did the last one first. So I advise these younger widows to marry again, have children, and take care of their homes. Then the enemy will not be able to say anything against them. Verse 15 is where we need to focus on. For I am afraid that some of them have already gone astray and now follow Satan. So it's absolutely possible to walk away from God and in turn follow Satan. And then I'm going to close with the one that we opened up with, and this is it, Revelation 3, 5. All of those who are victorious will be clothed in white, and I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce them before my Father and his angels that they are mine. I do not want to end. I'm going to close out here right now, but I do not want to end this with you fearing for your salvation. This is not a doomsday message. There was these two preachers that were standing up at this crossroads after a big flood came through. They're holding up signs. The end is near. And the next thing they knew, they would hear every car drive past them anyway and plunge into the the flood water. And finally, they looked at each other and said, do you think we should reward this a little bit? 
Maybe we should tell them bridges out. Some of y'all catch that later, right? Sometimes the wording of things. These guys are trying to do a good thing and keep people from driving off the bridge, but they're using the wrong words. And sometimes churches use the wrong words, and it hurts people. It, it scares people. I'm going to use God's words tonight. We're not talking about that you're an imperfect person, that you've made mistakes, that you've fallen short, that you've gotten saved, but you've, you've stumbled. We're not talking about that. That's not what God's talking about. He's not talking about being human. He's not talking about being a person, because that's what we all do. What he's talking about is you decisively deciding within the depth of your heart that you are going to walk away from Jesus. By either living in iniquity, which is a lifestyle of sin, or by refusing to believe what you once believed. So I don't want anybody here tonight getting spooked out and then driving home and worried about, you know, your seatbelt's like extra tight tonight, right? I want you to know God has grace beyond your imagination. When the righteous fall down seven, (laughs) they stand up eight. And that Jesus, this is the truth, but Jesus is also, he's full of both truth and grace. And he's making room. The scripture tells us to make room for each other's mistakes. If God's telling us to make room for one another's mistakes, then why in the world would God not make room for our mistakes? So again, he's not talking about you messing up, you blowing it, you having a moment, you having a few moments, you, you having a bad, a bad patch because life is just wearing you down. He's talking about knowing in your heart you've walked away. So I don't want anybody in here tonight under any false pretense because you start ripping scripture out like this. I'm telling you, you get that tighter than a frog's butt thing going on real fast. You just pucker it up like. I can tell you this in my heart. You know in your heart if you're right with God. And if you're not, then before we receive communion tonight, I want you to make your heart right with God. Because the scripture says that we should never receive communion together without first making our heart right with God. Otherwise, we invite the wrath of God upon our life. And for communion tonight, I, I want to tell you something. This Sunday, we are going to launch a, a new series, and, and we're giving books away for that new series like we did with the, the series on the Holy Spirit. But I heard something from the Holy Spirit this week, and I believe it stemmed out of what happened in Vegas and has carried over even into what's just going on in the culture of our nation. This Sunday, I'm going to be preaching just a one-time, very specific, special message called Only the Brave. And what it's going to be about is this. And I hope I can communicate this as clearly as I possibly can tonight. This nation is in the condition it's in not because of a a, a political party, not because of a certain person either or that's been or is president. This nation is not in the condition it's in because of the liberals moving from Europe or Texas isn't suffering because the liberals moving from California, right? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's because this nation, for the first time in its history, is not Christian anymore by the majority. And God is lifting His grace. And it's not. I've been saying this. You can listen back to to six years of me preaching at Reach, and you can go beyond that if you can find it. I've been saying this for 15 years. It's only going to keep getting worse until the church becomes the church that Jesus has called her to be. And we're going to talk next week about what that church is. That's the church we're going to look at next week. The church that Jesus longs for all of us 
to be. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll into it Sunday and then kind of tie it in. If you've got a young person that you know in your life, you got anybody you know just needs a God moment, get them here this coming Sunday and this coming Wednesday. And I believe God is going to work a miracle in their life. But all of that said, I want to just, as we receive communion tonight, I want to first just pray with you and make sure that anyone here that feels like they need to put their heart right before God has a chance to do that. But what I also want to do is I want to pray for our nation. The scripture says when we take communion, we come into unity. That's what the word communion means, is to come into union. We come into unity with the one, Jesus. Our nation needs to come into unity. Put aside our differences and get back to what made this nation great. And it's not just hard work and good values. It was because we all, by the majority, believed in one true God with one true Savior. We can't change the nation overnight, but we can keep changing them one person at a time and believe God for the revival that will pour out over this nation. Amen? So I'm asking if we could just bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment. I'm not going to extend this and make this extremely long. I'm just going to ask you one simple question. Are you certain in your heart that you are where you need to be with Jesus? Are you for sure within the depths of your heart that your life is right with God? If not, then let's make it right tonight. If you want to say yes to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand nice and high in the air. And then we're going to pray a prayer with you right through your app. Hands are already going up. If that's you on three, put them up. One, two, three. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for those hands. For each and every one that raised that hand, place it right on your heart. And you pray this prayer from the depths of your heart. I'm going to ask everybody here, let's join in because I'm going to add a prayer for our nation to the end of this salvation prayer. And we're going to pray as we come into unity with Jesus that he would begin to heal and mend our nation. Let's pray it all of us to our own two ears can hear it. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. You are the Son of God. You gave your life for me. Now I give my life to you. Forgive me for every sin every mistake I've ever made. Give me a fresh start, a new beginning. From this day forward, I dedicate my life to you. Holy Spirit, give me the strength and the courage to live it for you. Jesus, we ask you, heal our nation. Help our nation. Raise your church up to be who she is called to be. Help us be who we are called to be. In the name of Jesus, amen.